I am grateful for the piano and the pianists, the various uh, instruments that we have. But as I have often said, there is no instrument as beautiful as the human voice. And uh, what an excellent job, Rick. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, hopefully, my voice will hold out this morning. When the service is over, I may go back that direction. I will not shake hands with anyone. I'm going to try to be stingy and keep what I have to myself. I wish that those who gave it to me would have done the same. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12, if you would, this morning, please. Hebrews chapter 12. When you get there, if you'll place your bulletin there and then set it to the side for just a little while. How many of you here this morning do not like sports? You know that you are in the minority. <laughs> Actually, according to Gallup poll, 37% of the people do not care for sports. We didn't even have 37 people raise their hand this morning. But I'm assuming that those of you who did not raise your hand, that you're a part of the 63% who do like sports. Let me ask you this question. How many of you have ever competed in sports? Uh, maybe football or basketball, volleyball, tennis. Okay, many of you have. It's interesting the number of references in the Word of God to sports. I've never really gone through to figure it out for myself, but someone did that and they said that there are 55 references to sports in the Word of God. I'll take their word on it for now. But I do know this. I know that the Apostle Paul made references to sports, and he did that fairly frequently. And I know, too, that the Apostle Paul used sports as a picture of the Christian life. For example, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25, he talks about self-control. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 26, he talks about boxing. He didn't want to be like someone who just simply boxes the air. He wanted to be able to land his target. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, he talked about exercise. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, he talked about how the athlete would be crowned and so Christians one day will be crowned if they are faithful. But the picture that the Apostle Paul liked the most was the picture of a race. 1 Corinthians 9.24, 1 Corinthians 9.26, Galatians 2.2, Galatians 5.7, Philippians 2.16. The Apostle Paul is talking about a foot race. Remember again that Easterners think in terms of pictures. We're Westerners. Now that doesn't mean that we can't think in terms of pictures, but we have a tendency to think in terms of bullets and outlines and lists. When we listen to someone, we're always trying to pick out an outline of something. And if we're trying to remember something, we come up with an out. Easterners develop a picture. Well, here is a picture that's stuck. 
When the Apostle Paul saw a race, that picture stuck with him. Every time he would watch a race, he would think to himself, well, wait a minute. There's a guy who's really giving us all. I know Christians who are doing that too in their race for Christ. They're giving their all. Now, wait a minute. Here's a guy who's lagging behind on the track. He's hardly putting out any effort at all. And I know people like that. To the Apostle Paul, life was a race. Like sports or not, to the Apostle Paul, you are in a race. Now let's look at Hebrews chapter 12. And really, even before we read anything, I'll make a couple observations. Observation number one, the writer of Hebrews doesn't identify himself. Was it the Apostle Paul? Some think it was. Some think it wasn't. I have a lean in terms of what I think, but that's not really important now. But what really is important is that the person who wrote Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12 specifically, here was a guy who saw life, the Christian life, like Paul did. He saw it as a race. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 11, he goes through a listing of some of those in the Old Testament who ran the race. Ran the race for God. Oh, sure, there's Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah, Isaac, and on and on. These are people who, if you've read the word of God, you know that as they ran their race, they stumbled. Some of these people stumbled more than others. But they got back up. And they started running again. They didn't just simply sit on the track. They got up and they started running again. I don't know if the name Steve Prefontaine is familiar to any of you. But Steve was a long distance runner in the 72 Olympics. Steve made this comment, and I quote, a man can fail many times, but he isn't a failure until he begins to blame somebody else. Did you catch that? A man can fail many times, but he isn't a failure until he begins to blame somebody else. These people failed, but they took responsibility for their failures. They acknowledged many of their failures, some in the word of God itself. David certainly acknowledged his failures. But again, he didn't blame somebody else. He took the blame himself, and he got back up. And so we read in Hebrews chapter 12, beginning with verse 1, wherefore. The word wherefore, like the word therefore, means logical conclusion. What follows is a logical conclusion to what has preceded. The writer of the book of Hebrews has given a listing of people who ran a race. And now he says, wherefore, now it's time that you get in the race. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which thus so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him 
endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside. Lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. Lay aside the weight. The word weight that appears here in this passage comes from the Greek word agkos. It refers to anything that tangles you up. It refers to anything that hinders you, anything that holds you back. To the Greek athlete, it meant clothing. So the Greek athlete would take off his clothing. It meant bracelets, it meant shoes, it meant anything that could snag him, tangle him, hinder him in any way. It was so obvious to the Greek athlete. That's why he competed in the nude. He wanted nothing to hold him back. Well, it wasn't mandatory that the Greek athletes compete in the nude, but the Greek athlete wanted to win. And if getting rid of every little thing helped him to gain a little bit of advantage, he did it. He removed everything and anything that would keep him from winning. That picture stuck in the mind of the writer of the book of Hebrews. He would watch the men when they would run the race. They're out there and they're running. He would see them get rid of everything before they would really start running. That picture stuck. I probably don't need to clarify something this morning, but I'm going to anyway. This passage in the Word of God is not suggesting nudity. It is not suggesting obscenity or a lack of modesty or a violation of any principle or command in the Word of God. It is not. But there are people who will take any passage in the Word of God and they will use it for their own personal advantage to achieve, to get what they want. like the man who came to me quoting this passage in the Word of God. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And he said, my wife holds me back. So I'm going to get rid of my wife. Listen, guys, gals, don't you use the Word of God like that. In this passage in the Word of God, the writer is saying, get rid of every weight. Get rid of every odd cost. Get rid of every bulge. Get rid of every burden. Get rid of every impediment. Get rid of every encumberment. They don't have to be sin. They don't have to be. Oh, he mentions sin too. But that's not the issue here. There are things in our life that hold us back. We can't find in the Word of God that they are specifically sin, but they hold us back. They're simply excesses. They're simply additional things that consume our time or our energy or our attention, they distract us. They tangle us up. They hold us back from being 
our best from being the person the Lord wants us to be. The writer of the book of Hebrews is saying, by act of will, not because you are forced, but by act of will, choose to lay aside those things that hold you back. There are some people here in the sanctuary this morning for whom there may be all kinds of weights and sins that come to mind. And if that's so, that's good. Because you can't deal with them until you identify them. But my real concern this morning is with those people who can't think of any weights or sins that are holding them back. They're so accustomed to the pace that they're running right now. They're so accustomed to the race. They may just simply be hobbling along. Some are sitting on the track, but they're comfortable with that. They don't see anything in their life that they want to remove. Last week when Josh was speaking, Josh quoted Socrates. When Socrates said, the unexamined life is not worth living. I agree with that. More than 2,400 years ago, Socrates nailed it. At least right there. You have to examine your life. You have to identify those things in your life that you know are not pleasing to the Lord. Spend time in the word of God. Begin to identify those things. Lay aside, lay aside. Just like a piece of clothing. The idea of laying aside or taking off those things that hold us back is fairly common in the Word of God. In fact, there are a number of references in the Word of God where we're told specifically some of the things that we need to lay to the side. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. We need to put away lying. Colossians chapter 3, verse 8. We need to put off anger, wrath, and malice, blasphemy, and filthy communication. James chapter 1, verse 21. We need to get rid of all moral filth. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. We need to lay aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies, in all evil speakings. We need to get rid of them. Those are five natural responses to the problems that we confront as we're trying to run for Jesus Christ. As you come upon the hurdles or the frustrations of life, those are the kinds of things that we face. But it's interesting that the passage goes on and it says, lay aside all malice, all of that bitterness, all of that anger, all guile, all of that deceit, all hypocrisies, all of the phoniness. Get rid of all of the envies. The things you're looking at that other people have that you want to have it. And sometimes even wanting a little bit of harm for them that you would get 
you resent. And, and filthy communication. And Peter goes on and he says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And then he inserts such a small word that is so critically important. If, if so be that you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Here we go back to Western or to Eastern thinking again. If you have tasted, if you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, and so here you are and you're out on the track of life and you're trying to run your life for Christ, and you're confronted with these problems, the oppositions and all of the frustrations of life and and you just feel like retaliating. You, you feel like taking these negative responses in. And Peter is saying, wait a minute. If you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, then get rid of those things. See, part of the problem is, is that we have failed to realize how gracious the Lord is, how gracious he's been to us. And part of the problem is we like some of those things that we hold on to. We don't want to give them up. There are some here today who are really holding on to malice toward other people. And it brings some degree of comfort or satisfaction to you. That's why you're hanging on to it. We hang on to those things because they bring some degree of pleasure. They bring some degree of gratification. So we hold on. Even though they hold us back as we run for Christ. I heard an illustration years ago, but it has stuck with me. I heard that there is a tribe of Eskimos who have a unique way of killing wolves. They take a double-edged knife and they sharpen the blade until it's razor sharp. And then they dip it in seal blood. They stick it outside and they let it freeze. They dip it in seal blood. They stick it outside. They let it freeze. They stick it in seal blood. They stick it outside and let it freeze over and over and over again. Until they have created a bloody popsicle. And then they take the handle of the knife and they bury it in the ground. And they wait for a wolf who can smell blood up to two miles away. And when a wolf gains sense of the bloody knife, the wolf will come and he will begin licking the blood sickle. And the more he licks, and the more he licks, the colder his tongue becomes. He's still enjoying the taste, but his tongue begins to freeze. And he licks and he licks and he licks until he gets down to the knife and he doesn't realize that the blood that is now satisfying him is his own blood. And in the process of satisfying his own appetite, he is growing weaker and weaker. We are not Easterners. But do you get the picture? We hang on to things to satisfy our appetite. We embrace them with all of our energy, and we do so at the expense of strength. 
Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. The word race that is used in that passage is an interesting word. It's the Greek word agon, from which we get our word agony, agony. You see, the race is not a casual walk through the park. The race that is pictured here in this context is a race of agony. It's a marathon. It's tough. There are no hundred yard dashes here, my friends. It's a marathon. There are obstacles. It's demanding, it's grueling. It's a test of endurance. It is tough. I used to do some uh, jogging. <laughs> I was still doing it up until May of last year and I injured my one knee and I haven't been able to get back out and do any. I was never good, but I'd push myself. Carolyn and I live in Ellet, Ellet part of Akron. And on a few occasions, I would have Carolyn drive me up to Chagrin Falls, which is 26 and a half miles away, and drop me off. I remember the last time I did that, Carolyn was crying all the way. I don't know if she was afraid I wouldn't come back or if she was afraid I would come back. I don't know what it was. It was a hot day. The temperature was well in the 90s. And Carolyn said, this doesn't make sense. But sometimes you do things to prove to yourself, I guess. And I wanted to, and I did. Oh, it's hot. And I was dehydrating. Remember when I was still maybe a mile and a half or so from the house? Remember I could hardly stand up. My lungs were burning. My legs were so sore. There were times I wanted to give up. There were times when I said to myself, what in the world are you thinking of? It was no picnic. But you see, life isn't a picnic either. Frustrations, barriers, the agony, the surprises. I need to clarify something here. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. I don't have the same race that you have. You don't have the same race as anybody else. There are no two people here with the same race. Everyone who comes to Christ has a marathon to run. The course is different. The obstacles are different. The barriers are different. It is all different, but everyone has to run. That was true of these guys, too. They didn't run the same race. Do you think Noah ran the same race as Enoch? Isaac ran the same race as David? No. 
They had a different race, but they were expected to run. Get up and run. Some people say, I can't. I can't. You don't understand. You don't understand the challenges that I face. You don't understand the problems that I have. You're right, I don't. But I know from reading the word of God, the expectation is that you get up and run. Regardless. In a moment, I'm going to ask that a very short video be shown. I think it's maybe two minutes. It's a video of an 18-year-old girl by the name of Kayla Montgomery. Kayla's going to graduate from high school this year. Five, maybe six years ago, Kayla was injured when she was playing soccer. And shortly after that, she began losing feeling in her legs. There were a number of tests that were taken. Through the tests, they discovered that she had lesions on her spine and she had lesions on her brain. She was diagnosed as having an aggressive form of MS. I've known people with MS. Perhaps you have too. I've known some who were fighters. And I've known some who were not. By the way, prior to Kayla's injury, she was the slowest person on her soccer team. Did you get that? She was the slowest person on her soccer team. When Kayla discovered that she had MS, she stopped playing soccer because there's contact in soccer. And she started running. Someone with MS starting to run. It sounds like a joke. Unbelievable. She said, nothing is going to stop me. Nothing is going to hold me back, including the MS. She was training for six days a week. In a week's time, she would run 40 miles. She found that when she would run, after she ran a mile, her legs would go numb. And when she comes to the end of a race, yes, and she does race. She can't stop. She collapses. I want you to watch a little bit of the 3,200 meter, which is just shy of two miles. North Carolina State Championship that was run this past May, the last race that Kayla would run in her high school years. The final challenge came in May at the North Carolina State Championships for Outdoor Track, the final race of Kayla's high school career, the last time she'd run with coach at the finish line. All right, Shannon. You've given me all you got for four years. What happened? I fell. Temple. In the first lap about um, a little over 100 meters in. There you go, good job, Kayla! I guess I got squished. And then I fell backwards and I did like a little flip. <coughs> oh, come on! Well, wait, this she fell. I'm a Felina. Get back in it. I kind of chuckled to myself, like, this would happen, like, how ironic. It was, it was also a little hard. You don't expect it, and then you're on the ground. You have to get back up, but everybody else is farther ahead. It's, it's hard. So, hey, you got to get up. I was able to catch back up with the group. Gradually worked your way up. 
sat with the leaders, brushed it off, nothing ever happened. I sat on a couple girls for a, about three laps, and uh, I wanted to, I guess, pick up the pace. As you come around the final turn, what's going through you? Um, well, Bianca Bishop was in second place, and she's got a really great kick, and I knew it. Come on, hold her off! I, I knew she was going to catch me if I didn't go then, so I just I gave it my all, and I sprinted the fastest I've ever sprinted in my whole life. Come on! Come on! That is Kayla Montgomery of Mount Tabor. She will be your girls' 3,200-meter run champion. Wow. Yeah! We'll take it. Yeah, yeah, yeah! I got you. No! Oh, what a ball! I crossed that line, and I was so happy. Help me! <laughs> Help me! Please! Please! Help me! I couldn't have asked for a better finish or a better end of my uh, senior year. In the final race of her high school career, Kayla Montgomery finished the way she had so many times before, into her coach's arms, and in first place. From Mount Saber, Kayla Montgomery. To beat it, to outrun it, to know you got every movement out of those legs while you still can, that's why she's running. Friends now. Okay. I just hope to run as long as I can and to make the most out of it as long as I can. When or if I'm not able to run at some point down the road, then at least I can look back and know that when I could, I gave it my all. I can't do it. I can't. I have MS. I can't do it. I've fallen on the track. Everyone else is far out there ahead of me. But she got up. And she ran. By the way, Kayla's ranked number 21 in the country. Kayla says it's difficult to live with the disease where your own body is fighting against yourself. So when I'm running, I feel like I'm battling that. Keep in mind the biggest obstacle we have in this race is me. Itself. Run. Run. Run with patience. Hupa Mone, to abide under, but it's not just simply to be under the pressure and the frustrations, the agony, all the problems of life, but it's to remain faithful while you're there. Looking unto Jesus. The NIV and the NESB say, let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Don't focus on the problems of life. Don't focus on the agony. Kayla, don't focus on the MS. You focus on those kinds of things and you'll get off stride and you'll stumble and fix your eyes. Look unto Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. You know the funny thing about that? Our race is called an agon, agony, agony. But that's not what Jesus' race is called. His race is called kara, joy, delight privilege. As tough as his race was, Jesus considered it a privilege 
to be able to run his race, to please the Father and because of what he was going to do for us. He wasn't running for himself. He was running for us. Someone once said that every morning in Africa, a gazelle wakes up and it knows that it must run faster than the fastest lion or it's going to be killed. And every morning in Africa, a lion awakens. And it knows that it must run faster than the slowest gazelle. But it doesn't matter whether it's a lion or a gazelle. When the sun comes up in Africa, they better be running. And the problem is that many of us have come to feel no threat. We have come to feel no inspiration. We're so comfortable where we're at. We don't feel like we have to run. Thursday, we turn the page. Just another page on the calendar. Some of you stayed up to watch the ball drop. Carolyn and I went to bed. But our kids texted me. I, you know. There were fireworks that went off. There were celebrations all around the world. But it's more than the change of a page on the calendar. It's another lap, my friends. You are not done running. And every year when we turn the page, it's another lap that we have to run. Run, get up and run. You don't like sports? Maybe you do like sports. It really doesn't matter. You have been called to run the race. Did you hear the words of the coach, Patrick Cromwell, as he was yelling to Kayla? He said, drop the hammer. You've got to go now, Kayla. You've got to go now. Well, I want you to change that just a little bit and put your name there. Drop the hammer. You've got to run now for Christ. Run. Run. Father, what a privilege to even be able to get on the track What a privilege, Father, to be able to run, knowing of the people who have run before us, some of those mentioned in Scripture, many not. But run. Run with patience the race that is set before you, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of the faith. Father, I pray that as we prepare to close this service, I'm going to ask everyone to stand in just a moment as we sing a closing hymn. Father, I pray that the person here today who has not received Christ as Savior, Jesus, who for the joy went to the cross and died for them, and today, Father, they desire to come to receive this Jesus as their Savior. Maybe, Father, there are those who haven't been running the race as they should, but today they want to recommit to the race, recommit to you. Perhaps those who have come to present themselves for baptism or membership, Father, May your spirit move through our midst and encourage us to make those decisions that would be pleasing in your sight. 
In Christ's name, I pray. Amen. Won't you stand, please? Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moment and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise, let them flow in ceaseless Father, that's what you want us to do, to run the race for you. <laughs> How we need to focus on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. How we thank you, Father, for him, his example, for his grace, for his dying on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. Father, I do pray you'll encourage our minds, challenge our hearts, strengthen our resolve, encourage us to be the people that you want us to be, to your glory, in Christ's name, amen. God bless you. Have a great race. <laughs>